Good evening, uh, and a very warm welcome to um, this session. When we look at cities, many cities, through the words of some of Britain's leading poets and writers, what you're about to hear has been commissioned to celebrate our Festival of the Future City, uh, which is brought to you by the Bristol Festival of Ideas, and it's all been made possible with the support of Arts Council England, Innovate UK, Bristol City Council, and the University of the West of England. So big thanks to them for their support. Uh, my name is Jenny Lacey, and what I'm going to do is to tell you collectively who's here, and then as each writer comes up to the lectern, I'll tell you a little bit more about them. Except I have to tell you that they keep winning things, so I've had to amend my uh, notes a little as we go through. Um, so, I'm very pleased indeed to be introducing you to Liz Berry, Rachel Boast, Edson Burton, Rana Dasgupta, Melissa Harrison, W.N. Herbert, Ema McBride, Helen Mort, and Peter Robinson. Lem Sisse was about, uh, was due to be here through a very complicated video link from the other side of the world, and unfortunately we haven't been able to make that happen. Um, so they will each come up and read their work. If there's time at the end, we may be able to chat to them, but uh, if we could start with Helen. Mort, if you'd like to come to the lectern, and I shall tell you about Helen, and then she'll tell you a little bit about her piece, and then read it. So Helen is the Douglas Castor Cultural Fellow at the University of Leeds. Her first poetry collection, Division Street, was shortlisted for the Costa Prize and the T.S. Eliot Prize, and in 2014 won the Fenton Albra Prize. So will you please welcome Helen. Thank you. Uh, when we were asked to respond to the idea of the city, I immediately started thinking about, um, about one of the things that always strikes me about Sheffield, where I come from, is there are so many people who are fiercely proud of being from Sheffield and very affectionate towards it and who adopt it. And everyone talks about it being their city. So I was thinking about this phrase, this is my city or this is your city, uh, this is our city, and what that really means to, to kind of possess a city if you really can. So I've written a piece that is about uh, Sheffield, um, the, the place that gives me so many poems and uh, I don't think it needs much much glossing really except to say it mentions quite a few famous Sheffield bands who you may have heard of um, and also there's a reference to the moor and um, that's not a moor as in a windswept Bronte-esque moor it's a slightly run down shopping uh, shopping area in the city centre of Sheffield which is called the moor uh, so my poem is just called your city you say this is your city but how do you know would crooks and sharrow dim the house lights if you chose to go? Would the arts tower darken in your wake if you walked clean out of the world down Furnival Gate? You love those mornings when your body's made of seven hills and every crossing in the suburbs is a windowsill that you could step from, steady, slight as whitely trees. Your epitaph like something by the human league. Don't you want me? Don't you want me? No, there's not a corner of the moor that you don't know. Your life a slow audition for an Arctic monkey song. Your shibboleths, the names strangers get wrong. Malin, Grenell, Ollerton. You keep the Don and Porter underneath your skin. Your heart's a stainless lump you took out, flattened, put back in. You're a cooling tower turned shopping mall, an empty foundry rebuilt as a climbing wall. You are a lay-by, exit, passing place. Your frown draws maps of Warncliffe on your face. And when you smile, your park hill flats. And yet, no matter what you do, this city never looks straight back at you. The roads keep glancing past to somewhere out of sight. Tomorrow afternoon, next Friday night, those years of strangers standing where you stand right now, the students jostling through the heart of town, as if they all deserve to start again. You've touched this city, but you touch it like the rain. Thank you. Great, so Rachel Post is next, Rachel. And if I can um, introduce Rachel by saying she's the editor of the Echoing Gallery, Bristol Poets and Art in the City. Her book of poems, Side Reel, won the Forward Prize for Best First Collection and the Seamus Heaney Centre for Poetry Prize for Best First Collection as well. Uh, and Pilgrim's Flower was shortlisted for the Griffin Prize. You will hear the word prize a lot as I introduce these people to you. Uh, Rachel. 
Hello, thanks all for coming this evening. Um, the poem which I've written in response to this commission probably took about nine solid hours to write and it takes about 30 seconds to read out. <laughs> um, it's, it's within, I suppose, the genre of dream cities, uh, mythical cities, invisible cities, um, things like that, and it's set in, well, in a sense, it's set in Bristol because the genesis for it was uh, an afternoon I'd spent at the Barclay Square Hotel listening to a Bristol musician you may have heard of, Lady Nade. Now, when I sat down to write the poem, Lady Nade turned into the Lady Inanna, uh, who, as many of you will know, is a, a, another name for Venus in Sumer Sumerian tradition. And the story is that Enki, the creator god, rescues her from the underworld. And I didn't really know how I was going to approach the commission until I started writing. And the poem sort of seemed to write itself, to have a mind of its own. I'd like to just introduce the poem by, by quoting some... Um, introduction to a poem that W.S. Graham had done for his, for his piece, Malcolm Mooney's Land. It's W.S. Graham's birthday today. If you don't know the poet, then you must check him out. He's incredible. So, here we go. And this is paraphrasing him. Here I am. And, of course, the words you are about to hear will be invisible to you. I won't hint at what I think this poem is saying. As you hear it, it will mean something to you, to some degree, and it is, to some degree, my own. It begins with these five words. This could be any city. The words are now on their own. Sumerian dream vision of vertical gardens. This could be any city, in one lifetime or another, at a club we've never been to, at the square which could be the square of Pegasus, where, in the corner, the lady Inanna sings her dark songs to a slide guitar in a language unheard, in a time not yet ours. I've been waiting for this moment beyond the moment where I'm waiting for the waiting to end. And as we try not to look over at each other, except from the corner of our gaze, it's not that the room we're in is too bright, but that we see the light that lives inside our looking, within which vines and creepers of scented flowers cover a gate made of cedar and wrought iron in the shape of thoughts that can't be spoken, but it opens, and we find ourselves on the roof of a ziggurat where offerings have been left for centuries or more, the sides and the stairways covered in foliage, turned into vertical gardens for the god of the star of planetary strife and the god of the life-giving water and the word with his beard of lapis lazuli. We see it all in the blink of an eye, drawn back to the room where the lady still sings in that dark language we both understand of the love for the sanctum that cannot be entered except in moments like this, when heaven is left hanging in the underworld. Now give me your overdue caress. Let the early hours heal us, having drunk the ordeal 
poison from the poisoned streams. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. So now W. N. Herbert. See, they're very obedient. I call their names and up they come. Yes, <laughs> um, so let me introduce W. N. Herbert has published seven volumes of poetry and four pamphlets. He's probably done more since I wrote this, and his work has appeared in many anthologies. He's been shortlisted twice for the T.S. Eliot Prize, twice for the Saltire. He has four Poetry Book Society recommendations and he's won three Scottish Arts Council awards. In 2013, he was appointed Dundee's Macca, or City Laureate, and this year he became a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm, um, I'm really, really uh, pleased to be here. I'm delighted uh, to have been asked to do this commission, uh, which is, um, as you were hinting at, has un unlocked a, a problem in my, in my writing, and I, I've been um, writing a great deal about uh, my city, Dundee, uh, which, in Roy Frisch Fisher's phrase, is the, is the city that I think with. Um, it's my past, my present, and my future city. And so I've been, um, I've been repopulating it with insects. I've been relocating it to the, to the moon at dark side, naturally. And um, lately, I've been thinking of it in the wake of events as a place of welcome and as a place of refuge. And so I've been thinking about those ideas. I've been thinking about um, how long it took the Tories to discover their humanity and uh, how it was dependent on death stepping in as a diplomat and showing them the poor wee boy uh, drowned upon a beach. And uh, they suddenly considered Flebas for a moment. And then, in the wake of these horrors in Paris, death stepped in again, and the Tories have reverted to their usual format. And we're all looking at another war um, and I saw, contrary to this idea, uh, the kind of welcome that was being put forward in Scotland um, to people were being asked to come to the island of Butte, beautiful Butte, and uh, they were all going to be gathered together in the church, in the kirk, and they were all going to watch It's a Wonderful Life together at Christmas. And I thought, yeah, that's going to happen as well, isn't it? Um, so there, there was a kind of a uh, an ambivalence, an ambiguity, which crept into the composition of, of my work um, as I saw this rhetoric of medievalism um, being, uh, being uh, raised one more time. And we in Scotland and in the north of England have a medieval form of ambiguity uh, called, called the Border Ballad. And the Border Ballad uh, was written in the debatable lands between England and Scotland in the 16th century and concerns itself with murder, betrayal, death, dying ghosts of all sorts, and therefore it seemed to me to be an appropriate form for me to go back to, especially now as it seems like the future cities, our future cities, are actually made out of canvas, and they're tents sitting between borders where people cannot get from one to the other. So the poem is in the form of a welcome um, by the, the medieval trades of Dundee, the nine incorporated trades of Dundee, and... Um, there's just a couple of wee notes I'll just say to you, first of all, which is uh, there's a reference to uh, Mary Shelley in the poem. Mary Shelley was um, uh, welcomed to Dundee by the Baxters, a rich family in Dundee whose name is derived from a baker, uh, and uh, she was there during her teenage years, uh, which may explain a lot in the subsequent composition of Frankenstein. Um, there's also a reference to King Crispin's parade, um, in which the, the, the shoemakers used to march up and down. Uh, it used to be called St. Crispin's parade, but then... Protestantism happened, and it was rapidly renamed. And of course, we all know um, how good it is when Protestants get to march about the place. Um, and so, uh, again, um, uh, there is, in fact, a submissive Turk in this, uh, who, um, who you can still see in a painting in Dundee. And uh, finally, um, in uh, several of the locket books of the Nine Trades, the, the books with, with hasps that could be locked with key that contained the records, of the trades, so there's reference to sumptuary laws, um, the way that people were only allowed to dress in certain modes according to their stations in society. Um, uh, again, a, a rather familiar notion uh, in, 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 our, in our society uh, today. The only people who were exempt from this uh, were, of course, uh, prostitutes, uh, who are really the, the, the tenth and unincorporated trade. 
of the city. And uh, they are referred to in Scots as whores. Uh, so you will have that reference here. The nine trades welcome you to the city of refuge. The Baxter will bake you a bridey, my bride, my Mary of all the monsters that dream to bind the flesh of the, bi- the bridegroom fast, all mingled with fragments of shot between. Then the Cordoner will cut out two souls, my son, and so shoes since your pilgrimage is done. Such a shame you should walk to our city unshod, where the Turk was paraded in King Crispin's shade. And the Skinner, gee a glove for the hand that you lost to cutlass or crime or the snow on the hill. So you'll think of its scuttle like a, sho- a soft-backed crab, a shuttle between all the threads in our mill. The tailor will stitch up the cloth you'll be clad in, since eternity also has sumptuary laws. And his statutes still tell us, ne women shall wear, ne dresses aboon their estate, except whores. Then the bonnet maker caps you with a turi, my boy, all black with the Indies' best indigo too, for it's up with the bonnet, so bonny Dundee, since all who pay their fees shall be free. And the flesher shall strike you a calf with his axe on Commercial Street, so it falls to its knees, blinded by blood where the shambles once stood, for you are all brawl lads, if dusty of feet. Let the hammer men cunningly craft you a gun of the fishtail design or the old lemon butt and fashion you both the hauberk bold and the bullet that shall pierce it. Then the webster will weave you a shroud so fine as muslin from Mosul or Gaza's old gauze. The cutty sark shall be your sign that your bairns have been swaddled in some future's cause. And the dyer will print out your ends and your means, inking his press with gall of the oak, listing your numbers, if rarely your names, and sealing the news in his locket book. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. And now um, Melissa Harrison, uh, who (coughs) is going to read. She, um, again, somebody who has won something recently. So let me tell you about the older things, then we'll move on to that. She won the John Muir Trust's Award for Wild Writing in 2010. Her first novel, Clay, was published by Bloomsbury in January 2013. And that was selected as an Amazon rising star. It won the Portsmouth First Fiction Award and was named by Alice Smith as one of her books of the year. And her second novel, At Hawthorne Time, uh, was published this year. It's just been announced that it's um, nominated for, have I got that right? I want to make absolutely sure that I'm getting this right. The uh, Costa Best Novel Award. And Melissa um, writes for the Financial Times and the Times, where she also contributes to their weekly Nature Notebook column. Thank you. Um, My response to this commission was a short story, which, although short, was too long to read tonight. So um, what I'm going to give you is a cut-and-shut version. Um, But I hope that when the book comes out, which I think is coming out in April, that you'll get hold of it and have a look at the full thing. Um, My writing is, is largely concerned with the natural world. And so when I was thinking about writing about the city... Um, I found a way to uh, write about nature but also to try and embody some of the pressures that cities are under and some of the um, things that are in the air at the moment that we're all concerned about. It's called State of Nature. For some reason, it's the little owls I can't forget. I've no idea why. They hardly mattered, given everything else. Yet all these years later, I can still remember how light they were, how sharp their keel bones felt, deep under all their dappled feathers. It's stupid, I know, but I can't seem to get over how the female's foot, with its four little talons, gripped my finger so tightly as I held her in my hands. Gorham's wood is a remnant of the ancient forest that once crept right up to the old city walls. 
I like to think of it full of wild boars and white hearts being hunted by English nobles, though peasants driving swine is probably closer to the truth. A group of locals began looking after it back in the 90s. Nothing useful, of course, just litter picking and cutting back the brambles. But at some point, they got help from one of the big wildlife charities. And by the time I moved to the city, it was no longer dark and overgrown, full of rotting mattresses and condoms, but well-managed woodland, a spring-flowering meadow, and a pond edged with yellow irises. The first time I saw it, one May morning nearly a decade ago, it seemed to me like, well, a bit like paradise. I was never an official volunteer there. The papers got that wrong, along with everything else. At first, I was just a punter. I took the kids there every Saturday, while their mother still let them come, that is. Afterwards, I'd take them to the IMAX or the soft play, and then I'd walk them back as far as her front gate and go for a pint or three. It's tiring looking after kids. I started going there on weekdays after I lost my job. At first, I'd just sit and smoke. Sometimes I'd have a nip of something to keep the weather off. I began picking up the odd bit of litter, just around my bench at first, but then around the others. I bought a box of those blue surgical gloves off the internet and started coming most days. At first, I think the volunteers thought I was an alky or something, so they weren't too friendly. Eventually, I stopped bringing the Jamesons with me. That helped. There was so much potential on a small, enclosed site like Gorham's to get it right, to make it perfect. But equally, it was obvious to me, if not to the others, how easily it could all go wrong. That's why I started getting rid of things that didn't belong. Japanese knotweed, Spanish bluebells, those bloody American terrapins in the pond. My job, as I saw it, was to be another set of eyes, a guardian, if you like. I told the local paper all that, you know. I explained that I was just doing my bit. The two Canada geese and the grey squirrels, OK, they were a mistake. <laughs> and the little owls and their chicks. I don't see the kids anymore, which is, well, it's hard. They're 12 and 14 now. I send birthday cards every year with a tenor in, but they don't write back. I get by. I do 20 hours a week on the tills at Tesco, and I sweep up at the hairdressers on Saturdays. I volunteer at the charity shop, too, and the British Legion. It keeps me busy. I don't go to Gorham's Wood anymore, of course. I haven't for years now. I may not have gone about it the textbook way, but my motives were pure. I can always say that. I love that place. It was important to me. I wanted to conserve it for my two kids, for the nation, really. It was so perfect, so beautiful, and it had history, too. It was a fragment of old England. Did I mention that? It's about preserving how things used to be, how things should be. Do you see that? Do you get what I'm saying? I just can't stand to think of things changing. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So Liz is next. Liz Berry. Um, and let me introduce Liz by saying that her poems have appeared in many magazines and anthologies. They've been broadcast on BBC Radio and recorded for the Poetry Archive. Her debut collection, Black Country, was a Poetry Book Society recommendation. It won the Forward Prize for Best First Collection in 2014, and it's just been awarded the Geoffrey Faber Memorial Award uh, and also the Somerset Morn Award. When I was commissioned to write a poem about the future city, I went along to the museum in Birmingham, the city where I live, to see an exhibition about Birmingham's approach to planning and architecture. Um, Birmingham's got a well-deserved reputation um, for being something of a dreaming city. It's eternally optimistic, even at the same time as being completely hopeless. Because Birmingham is always trying to build the future, so it builds with great dream and optimism, and then the future arrives, and it looks absolutely nothing like we imagined it would. Um, so then we knock it all down and start again. But there was one tiny section of the exhibition which really captured me, and it was a display about the bombsite blooms of Birmingham. So the flowers and weeds, the ragwort, the colt's foot, the rouse by willow herb, the little creatures that had grown and flourished in the post-war bomb sites and the post-industrial sites of Birmingham. I was really enchanted by the idea that 
these unplanned for, uninvited little forms of life had crept in and started to take over the city without anyone even noticing. And to me, it was really enchanting to think that might be part of something bigger or something grander, that while we're all here busy making plans and building new stations and grand offices, that actually the real business of life is plodding slowly on, completely unaware of us. The poem's called Dreamingham. <laughs> Over our city grass will grow, and in the collied rubble of the ring road, rose by willow herb will sway its feathered throat, rogue and careless, as a boy being kissed in an alley at dusk. Our townscapes, our grids, they'll mean nothing to wet the beds. These tower blocks will be palaces for blue bottles and moss piglets, who care only for air, feast and hum. Already it's begun. There is lichen flowering in the Queen's Way tunnel. A petrol-throated pigeon jimmicks its wings in the mansions where our money was spent. Our factories, motors, our shining libraries and the sump of the cut. Bramble and spider will watch them all come undone as ragwort and earthworms creep in like conquistadors, loving only our bodies mouldering in the bone orchards. Kingdom follows kingdom, so the city slips like an elver from our paper architecture. So feed your plans to the wind and follow me out into the edgelands We'll bow to knotweed and moss, to new leaf and crow. And I'll kiss you beneath the rotunda's mournful glow until our limbs bloom fever few and the convention centres return to copses, sighing with light. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and Edson Burton is next. He's a local boy. I think that's fair to say, isn't it, Edson? Yeah, that's fair to say. <laughs> 20 years. I think 20 years makes you a local boy, doesn't Definitely. it? Definitely. Yeah. Um, so let me introduce Edson properly. He's a writer and historian. He's written several plays for BBC Radio 4 and regional radio, and he's published his first collection of poetry, Seasoned, in 2008. He's the project coordinator at the Trinity Arts Centre here in Bristol, and he's part of Come the Revolution, a collective of curators, programmers, and creatives from Bristol and Birmingham, committed to exploring and challenging black life experience and cultural expression through the cinema. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things that I've always been interested in, in sci-fi, um, and I guess also interested in power. So when um, I was asked to, to write a poem, I kind of thought, well, what would it look like to have a world in which the most incredible technological advances were available, but not available to all? Um, what would it be like to imagine a world in which also uh, current trends around gentrification, uh, who lives in the city center, who lives further out, um, were sort of lived out to the to their to their nth degree, um, and what would it mean to also live in a world in which there isn't a welfare state and there isn't currency? So I kind of threw these things together um, in this poem, which I will. <laughs> well, I was kind of worried about writing too little, and I think I've gone the other other way. <laughs> Is that not right? So um, <clears throat> it will be some kind of extract from the poem, but it will begin at the the beginning and give you some kind of logical end point, uh, I hope. Um, just one explanation. I was told not to never explain poems, but I think this might be useful. So uh, 
signs are uh, people. So it replaces worker. The re-signed are people who have been let go of. So that's the only explanation I think is necessary. Uh, it's in a couple of parts. So this is the snail. A giant snail stretched along the scoop and rise of Dundry's summit exhales scented mist from metal shell, stitched from micropores pulsing blue in preset answer to sun's rise and fall. Glass in a shell, a pane of roving colours. Beneath the shell, synthetic trees encased in lilac living bark rise from cabled roots sucking cool water from pools buried in cavernous earth. Each branch curves into leaf-like cell. Inside each cell, a body breathes encased in a shell. Signed workers, 12-hour shift spent, float in customised dreams. Smart suits, scrub, clip, shave, scan. Body cams submit to microsecond reports. Sensors shoot data along leaf, branch, living bark to tubular web concealed in stem. Rapid conference calculate and set new targets. Upon lower levels, leaf cameras, masters, microfibers twitch, turn in balletic capture. Across multiple zones, legions of signed workers press the company's motto, bespoke, built, and yours in 24 hours. Each team set in zones fittingly themed, concept among Doric Column, design in Redwood Cabin, assembly in neon lit disco, distribution in Sand Dune. Continuity signs enforce customer spec. Vehicles, skyboards, flyboots, suits, headsuits, headsets, like bones gathering flesh, trek around the inner track, out to bullet swift trams. Inner screen flash, fatigue is the enemy, fight for the team. Pumping vocals scream harder, stronger, faster. Over 200 BPM beats, shuffle play, company channel, finds personal faves. Timed boom achieves shock, sunrise hour blasts pinprick eyes. Smart gloves accelerate at fade of manual dexterity. At first droop, suit monitor trills. Would you like to take a pill? Pace builds to individuated break. Memory sofas responding to weight, reform become milk musky mattress. The signs gather around super screens, catch episodes of company soap, interspersed with soft focus testimony. Suits pick up residual collapse. Fingers, minus smart gloves, are slow. Enhanced focus pills fail to push back. Evidence crisis is setting. The sign, excised, is subject to guidance review conducted in translucent cubes, hologram beads tests, verbal reasoning, assembly, creativity, psychology, cognitive, company knowledge, nano rovers extract blood samples. A tense wait to discover if contract will be renewed. Tiled floor flash verdict. Lemon yellow cheered. Congratulations, your contract is renewed. Azir blue for time out and see you soon. Resigned workers form orderly queue. Pick up, review. Released until guidance review is gut ridden. Heads bowed, they step into dancing dust that writhe and wave a slow farewell. Synth graph awaken, glow and dim as if mistaken. Laser gates cool to allow exit. Zone three. Sunken wrecks, the resigned shuffle across the plain, blinking into slate gray day, ghostly shades of terracotta, roofscape whisper into view. Fearful of favor seeking tongues, they exchange strategic smiles. Entering to old Bishopworth, they are met with sneer and pity. Deadweight laughter drops from scorched towers stripped like cadavers. Alt community look down. Bearded mother lifts inked child to the sight. A warning, best to stay outside. Weighed down by hacked gizmos, corn road traders linger outside bazaar walls. Bark Spanish Arabic creoles. The bartering is swift and brutal. Every minute spent, the suits lose their privileges. Under the wolfish watch, the resigned strip. Traders toss suits to hack teams, poised in labs behind half-open shutters. 
In seconds, they slice, snap, crack, reconnect, ready to suit for the highest bidder. Shivering like chicks freshly exposed, the resigned stumble into lo-fi cotton tunics. The traders gloat. Withdrawal into skin begins. Palms raised, the designed are needle pierced with credit chip, discarded. Spider. Credit rich, the spider surveys the web. Shell shocked Gulf War III veterans called to ecumenical prayer rising from an ivory minaret. Head wringing, hand wringing care from zone one charities, loans they spent in return for hours spent waiting for vacancies flashed up on street corner screens. Lean living among barter community, dream binging in mildewed Chessel street dens, tracing steps, home, stilted conversation, confession, alien, unaltered rest. The spider procures one last thrill. The spider stares along the carriage. Elder squints to capture outside blur. Hacked eye glistens liquid silver, returning fading vision to dark. Rise and fall of dyed lavender skin. Girl grips armrest locked in headset throat. Hyper-muscled horn tradesman flicks dust from bull logo, stitched to meat slab chest. Rouged lips part to take in in um, rouged lips part to take in shed pill, audible exhale as distended stomach deflates. Carriage slows, rocks the complete pause. Elevators attach, doors rise like wings. Train fills. The spider takes in vine and wood compounds, faces looking out from glass roof courts. Smart suits, skin dyes reduced to subtle minimum give understated impression, hacked eyed elder shrinks. Pale urchin, black tear streaming, turns attention, becomes a hologram announcing Old Vic's new season. Light dims as carriage dips into tunnel below the cut, pastel debris from old Totterdam plastered on wet rock. Rush to pop regens as carriage curls up into temple station, grooves fade, loose skin tightens, eyes brighten. Carriage empties. Palm raised passengers register purpose and credit status. The spider finds an unmarked exit. Ed, thank you very much indeed. Um, and Peter Robinson is next. Um, so let me tell you that Peter's work includes This Other Life, which won the Cheltenham Prize, About Time 2, The Look of Goodbye and Like the Living End. In 27, he became Professor of English and American Literature at the University of Reading. There he started the publication of an annual creative arts anthology and has helped found the Reading Poetry Festival. He's a regular contributor of book reviews and literary criticism to poetry magazines, academic journals and newspapers. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Um, it never, it makes much better sense if there are people listening to it, I always find. Um, it's also really lovely to be reading in Bristol, um, which, uh, as some of you may well know, is the, um, the place where modern poetry as we know it began in 1798 when Joseph Cottle published the lyrical ballads here. And there's a, I'm glad to say there's a plaque on the building just somewhere over there where he did it. Um, my poem connects very slightly with... Uh, I, I, I slightly got the idea of the commission wrong because I read the, the Bristol Festival of Ideas and then I read the Festival of the Future City. So I imagined that the commission was to be about Bristol. And um, so I have never lived in Bristol, but I've visited Bristol a number of times and all sorts of things have happened here. Um, so uh, what I did when I was asked to write a poem is I just sort of imagined together all of the different things that had happened when I've been in uh, Bristol in the past and then imagined some of the things that might happen in the future. So it's about remembering and imagining. Uh, it's called Bristol Voluntaries and um, as I was saying it links back to Wordsworth because there's a 
he wrote a, a late poem called Evening Voluntaries, and I think I probably got the idea from the title there, although I don't know word this poem very well. So this is called Bristol Voluntaries, um, and um, it's dedicated to Tom and Sarah Phillips, who um, uh, live here. Bristol Voluntaries. Waking, jet-lagged, in the small hours, for a moment among blind summits, the steep and over streets, linked districts to traipse through, to linger. I'm lost where grounds suddenly ended in a gorge, new cut at low water. Or once more beside Cabot Tower's point of vantage, stranded in a past to live up to or down, it requires some place to remember, like a Southville, a Clifton, St. Paul's, gulls cries in earshot. It wants a seaport town where offered a bed for the night, I'm paused at this nail-worn bollard and talked back to myself as well by a friend or family member. But that time, beside Cabot Tower, street lamps come on at twilight like Mallarmé's train of jewellery fire. I'd let my thoughts wander up or down White Lady's Road, had gone over how we would have to, we would leave us both written off, put asunder, with other lives to live. Reeking ghost cargoes, what's gone from its past won't be undone in my own, and no, I can't live down, unforgivable, remember. It has mute memorials everywhere to be passed by, noticed, missed, like places to start from for Hispaniola, as still now we have to go on. And always, wherever, my thoughts are of what it would be like to live here in this once and future city, surrounded by school runs, commutes, the shortcuts by dock walks, the cobbles erupting through asphalt. Imagine pasts like ours, gulfs, downfalls of the heart lived over and over, or futures on open days, people wondering as at job interviews what it would be like to live here and then try going out through traffic management flows, no choices, dead ends, ring roads, by means of other suburbs on a plain ordinary day, to ask for directions, have snapshots of more streets slipping away in quiet heartlands, imagine where greenery thrives and clutter from lives is inherited, cherished at the homes of a son or a daughter, then on by grass verges, islands turned into edible plots, allotments, is how I'd imagine a different future by watershed or the Arnolfini, with chances, imagine, to choose community, township, be sure in the arms of, no, not where we have, but places we want to live, as pastel terraces on hill crests opposite at sunset, will enhance the light. Peter, thank you very much indeed. Um, and next it's Ema McBride. So let me tell you that um, Ema studied acting at the Drama Centre in London and her first novel, A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing, won the inaugural Goldsmiths Prize in 2013 and the 2014 Bailey's Women's Prize for Fiction. I really like cities, so I just wrote a little piece of prose about cities. I am always losing cities passing through them, catching at and not understanding. Looking, though, always looking, beyond my shoes and into their streets, over their heads and into their distances, wondering what hides below their shine of lights at night, thinking about falling into their worlds and considering their different life, lives, histories, what stays buried beneath their streets or across their wharves and up their cranes, down from their towers and into their estates and stately counting houses, swaying with the weight of sin. For the cities all things to all people, 
There's one for every person you can name. Cities on mountains are flanked by trees, desert cities, cities on rivers, in the jungle or by seas. Some cities turn their faces to that, open arms and make themselves cats fit for stroking. Some cities turn away, tire of the role of tide and life, build up, wall up behind fatigue and choose that time to symbolise all they will ever be. Some cities fight it, put up lights, kick up their heels and make themselves triumph. Good at this, if only for stalling the grow of future and more. For history's coming, always is. Because the streets stay busy, making time, pushing through, passing on. And the buildings are peeling their faces off, making new, making fresh, bringing the world to or from, however the cities please. And sometimes they are ripped at, ripped at, lie backbones exposed, sometimes drown or fear drowning, sometimes shook, sometimes burned like the idols they are or were. Sometimes they are memories, often they are lies. Sometimes everyone gets stuck in one and then cities themselves despise the living, gouging out their sides, sucking them for everything and all. There is a float to cities, each its own, match to it, or get you gone, or stay at your peril, where you might find that dark black in your lungs, city air, human dust, crushing down the gullets when it's hula hot, out on balconies, roofs for some, cardboard covered winters when it's pelting down, person and path the same. For even looking up, you can glimpse that corrugated roof, that blanket on sticks, that pigeon eating chicken or woman had for lunch. City ever punching through. Night in the city divides itself up. One for you, one for you. Hawkish if you want, or maybe pleasing to every whim. Good for marauders, carnage for children. It is clicks and rubbed pants and trainers in the wet and no light on in the doorway or porch or in the street. It is give me your handbag or lie down there or don't scream or don't fight back. But city too, in hides of hedge, up back streets and down basement steps gives places for a little fun or sex or pity or escape. City of helping free from traps for those who barely get out alive. City's five friends, two friends, no friends, dawn, making off across the streets from the dragging lasts of clubs. It is early cups of tea and egg and chips. It is watching bridges open. It is starved for sleep. It is the fear of airplanes in the sky. Cities are the bargain and the gift. I know their holy names. City of God, earthly city, city of hope, city of pain of the time before time, of what will be again. I am all for the city, even drenched in its spit. Even when it tells me I am not fit, it stays mine. I have made myself for it. City I, I'll always wait for what you'll be. Ema, thank you very much indeed. And uh, finally, Rana Dasgupta. <coughs> where I think we're going a little further afield. <coughs> um, and let me just introduce Rana as a novelist and essayist. He won the 2010 Commonwealth Writers' Prize for Best Book for his first novel, Solo. Um, he's also the author of a collection of urban folk tales, Tokyo Cancelled, which was shortlisted for the 25 John Llewellyn Rees Prize. And his first work of nonfiction, Capital, a portrait of 21st century Delhi, explores Delhi's story of capitalist transformation. And I think, Arana, am I right? That's what you're reading from. Yeah. Good evening. I, in answer to this commission, wrote an essay, uh, which was about the future of cities as I saw them. I, I do a certain amount of journalism and things, and I felt it was a very tedious way to end this poetic evening, and I wanted to read something more poetic. So I'm not reading the essay. I think it's published in the catalogue that accompanies this, um, this festival. Um, when I began, my first book was a, was a series of folk tales about cities. I've always written about cities. In fact, my work could be really one long love letter to cities. Uh, my first book was a, was a series of folk tales, uh, Chaucerian, Chaucer-like, in which a series of travellers caught in an airport spend a night 
uh, when their flight is delayed, telling stories to each other which come from 13 different cities. And, and the cities are the characters in these stories. And then I wrote a novel which was about uh, a city I just sort of fell in love with, which, was, uh, which is Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria. Um, but for my poetic um, offering this evening, I'm actually going to um, read something from my latest book, Capital, which is not... Um, which is not fiction, and indeed, it's the most fairy tale thing I've written. It's, it's fact. Um, because I was, through this book, trying to discover uh, or make contact with the city I lived in, I had my adopted city of New Delhi, um, which, is a, which has been going through um, immense uh, turbulence of good and bad sorts in the last 15 or 20 years because of the opening up of the economy and all the massive things that have happened as a result. Um, the section I'm going to read is about, um, is about the relationship in that city of Hindus to Muslims. Um, a lot of the, the conversations I've heard today um, have mentioned words like tolerance and multiculturalism. Um, and though these are almost the slogans of our global state religion, we still seem to manage to drift apart um, and for previously integrated communities to unravel in all kinds of ways. There does seem to be something about our age and maybe our economic system that feeds a suspicion, a sort of hygienic distance. Um, uh, we seem to prefer simple explanations of other people and of our communities to a complex ones that we maybe had before. Um, and in looking at these things, I find that often the, the, the intellectual work we do to try and understand these things is, is focused on, on minorities, quote unquote, on those people who are excluded or, or, or who do not set the tone for society at large. But often what is more interesting to me is the majority. These are the people with the, who, are, who are driving the psychological and cultural um, agenda. And in Delhi, the, that majority is, um, is North Indian Hindus, um, tiny little historical um, digression, where, which is to say that the, the culture of the city was set, very much set in place by the very traumatic and, and monumental events of 1947 when Pakistan and India were, 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 British India was divided into Pakistan and India. And for Delhi, that meant that the Muslims left in enormous numbers, the Muslims who had been the previous Mughal elite, um, who had presided over a magnificent culture uh, of, of philosophy, music, and art, and the form of, of this that you'll encounter in this passage is Kavali music, uh, an 800-year-old uh, Sufi music directed, spoken in, in uh, the language of Islam, but very much a Hindu-Muslim co-production. Um, it meant the, 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 the exodus of Muslims, and it meant the arrival of many uh, Hindus who were, had suffered enormous violence and loss of property in their homes in, in what became Pakistan, and arrived, therefore, um, um, traumatized, poor refugees who had to make their lives, and they basically, to generalize, decided that they would make lots of money, and that would substitute for what they had lost, and it would, it would immunize them against further vulnerability. And they've grown up with a, a complete horror of Muslims, uh, a visceral horror which... Uh, which dictates the tone of the city in all kinds of ways. And this is a passage that I wrote um, in which I tried to... Thank you for that. Um, tried to shed some light on, on, on the great <coughs> psychological depth of these kinds of um, prejudices and things. So I hope you enjoy it. One evening I go to a Kavali concert in the gardens of the India International Centre a well-known cultural institution in central Delhi. A group of musicians has come from Pakistan. They take their places as the day ends. Far above, bands of shrieking parakeets 
which rediscover their sense of direction when the sun touches the horizon, fly home in straight lines across the sky. The first bats are flickering among the trees. It is a weekday and the audience members have come from offices. Tight-lipped Hindu bureaucrats in blazers and ties shuffle around in the rows of plastic seats, hassled and not yet present to the music. The musicians take no account of the unrest around. Their music lifts off straight away to an extraordinary pitch of ecstasy and yearning. The voices soaring one after another to the yawning sky, drums filling the static garden with dance, hands clasping at heaven. The head koal is a man of extraterrestrial magnetism, portly and jowled, his fingers dart weightlessly, drawing sound in the air, and his voice is abundant with every kind of desire, spiritual and carnal. He wears a brilliant white kurta embroidered around the neck and a scarf which he tosses like a mane of golden hair. Over the course of the first 40 minutes or so, something amazing happens in the audience. The men begin to make twitches of enjoyment, but they are embarrassed at first and fearful of sen and they look around them quickly after each full arm gesticulation, fearful of censure. But the spirit spreads and soon everyone is touched by it. Their restraint leaves them and they leap from their chairs in elation. They are full-heartedly clapping, swaying and crying out. Something has entered them from the outside. Their bodies are making unaccustomed movements and they are moaning with words from elsewhere. They are going to the stage to give money and the Hindu women cover their heads and bow before the foreigners. Salam, Islam is pouring out of these people who lie awake at night terrified that their daughter might marry a Muslim. These people who were not even born in the days when these gestures were de rigueur know them nonetheless. Look at the men in the audience, these unimaginative men who love rules, who fast on Tuesdays and believe they are virtuous because they deny themselves pleasure. These suspicious men whose brahminical anxieties keep them from eating out, mixing with strangers or walking in the streets. These dutiful men who work hard but speak poorly. Look at these men who are so conditioned to murder the feminine within them that they cannot keep themselves from stamping on girls and women without. Look at how they desire this Sufi on stage, the weeping, tuneful, beautiful Muslim whose passions overflow, the man of poetry and eloquence, the man of universal desire, the man who has not sacrificed his feeling, who has never learned that ecstasy and song are effeminate. Look at how they take him, the, take him into themselves and try to fill themselves with him, how his gestures infect their own, how his passion lights up their faces. Look how this Muslim can set a fire in the hearts of these Hindus and set them free. Look how he can restore them to everything they have been. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, all of you. Uh, it was an enormously impressive array of different feelings and thoughts and a sense of place. Um, so thank you very much indeed, for, both for writing and, and for bringing it here tonight. So that's Liz Berry and Rachel Boast and Edson Burton and Rana Dasgupta and Melissa Harrison and W.N. Herbert and Ema McBride, Helen Mort and Peter Robinson. Thank you so very much. <laughs>